Let's go to Steve in Canada. Thanks so much for holding. Welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Uh, it's really nice to talk to you. I'm a big fan. Uh, normally, I wouldn't be able to call your line, but because of all this corona, I have the time. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a uh, passage I've always struggled with, uh, Exodus 34. Yeah. I have uh, two different Bible versions right here. I got the NIV, and I got the ESV. Yep. And, um, you know, when God's, you know, showing Moses his glory, his name there, you know, he talks about all the loving things like slow to anger, mercy, grace, abounding in uh, steadfast love and faithfulness. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on but um, to say that by no means clear the guilty, you know, and here's where uh, the point I want to ask your opinion about. You know, in the NIV, it says that he punishes the children of their children for the sin of the parents, you know, which, you know, kind of confuses me. But if I go to the ESV, it talks about visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So my question to you is, you know, like, how should I interpret that? Is that... um, the way I think I understand it is uh, that God's so concerned about holding people accountable for their sin that if their sin affects like future generations, that he's going to hold that uh, parent accountable for how that sin could affect uh, people, future generations. Am I correct in assuming that or is God, you know, per, um you know, punishing children. Yeah, so so the yeah, it's a it. it's a great question, and I'm so glad you were you were able to call. It comes down to the meaning oh. of the Hebrew root pakad, which is normally translated to visit. But what does that mean? There was a whole book written on it years ago where pakad was rendered as determining the destiny. But it's one of those verbs that you have to really think through in terms of what it actually means. The NIV is wrong because it does not mean that he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. We know, for example, that in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, uh, it says this specifically, Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. However, we also know that my sin has consequences for my children, and if my children continue in that sin for their children, and if they continue in it for the children after, in in other words, we reap what we sow. That's the way God has set it up. So if if I am a God mocker, and, and I continue in that, and God forbid, so I continue, that's who I am, and I continue in that, then that iniquity is now visited on my children. They have now grown up in that, and there is a divine judgment because of the responsibility of parents where that now falls heavier on the next generation. And if that next generation hardens his heart even more, it falls even more deeply. So even sociologically, the children of alcoholics have a much better chance of becoming alcoholics than your children of non-alcoholics. So it's not a punishment where I stole something and now you go to jail for it, but rather if I am a thief, that you are more likely to become a thief yourself, not just by environment, but by divine judgment because of the responsibility of a parent. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's the way I understand it too. You know, often I'm talking with different people, you know, I'm trying to witness uh, to non-believers or sometimes I might uh, come into contact with uh, Calvinists, and you know I'll say you know I, I reject Calvinism, and I will talk about certain passages in the Bible, and um, I'll talk about God's holy nature, and I'll refer to that, and then they would you know in turn respond uh, to me and say, hey look, you know the children of the fathers and stuff like that are being punished, you know, so then they do that as an excuse for certain Calvinist interpretations. Yeah, and, and I would, yeah. and, and That's of course, I always want yeah. to ask about that. Yes, thank you, Steve. And, and even when you have a situation, say, where there's judicial hardness, 
one generation rejects the gospel of Jewish leaders. Now there's a hardness of heart on the people. Uh, what we're told, though, in 2 Corinthians 3 is that the veil is there, but when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So anyone can humble themselves. You have it throughout the Bible. Ezekiel 18 deals with that. When the son says, I'm not going to follow in the father's ways, then the father will bless that son. And if, if that son has a son and that son says, well, I'm not going to follow in my father's righteous ways, I'm going to go and become wicked, then he's going to suffer for those sins. That's the way it's laid out. Now, at the end of Lamentations 5, it does say our father sinned and, and we're bearing the punishment. In other words, they sinned and now judgment fell on us and now we're in exile. So there are consequences from one generation to the next. But it is not a matter of God actively punishing the next generation for the sins of the previous generation. 